Thank you for inviting me to present at the International Viral Hepatitis Elimination Meeting. I'm currently in Malaysia. I'm sorry I can't be there in person to join you, but I'm really delighted to talk about this important topic of reducing harm and improving care for people living with HIV and viral hepatitis. Here are my disclosures, and none of them are directly relevant to the content of the presentation today. So let me start um, briefly after the epidemiology, which I uh, just been presented by speakers before me, to just reinforce that the number of people living with hepatitis B and HIV co-infection is probably around two to three million people globally, and a similarly, uh, similar number of two to three million people are living with hepatitis C and HIV globally as well. And this is out of uh, more than 350 or 380 million people uh, living with these three infections. So of course, it's a very broad global burden of disease, but the intersection affects a far smaller num number of people. However, uh, amongst people living with HIV, there are higher risks of both hepatitis C and hepatitis B. And there are some populations uh, and risk groups particularly who we need to think about when we think about improving clinical care. Firstly, amongst those with hepatitis C and HIV, People who inject drugs are the main population affected, uh, and there are higher risks uh, for people who are uh, engaged in commercial sex work, uh, people who, uh, who are in prison particularly, and also men who have sex with men. And you can see some estimates, the rate uh, that any of these particular characteristics have in terms of higher rates of hepatitis C amongst people with HIV. Being in prison is the highest, but of course, this is global data, so it's very uh, tailored to individual situations, and there's a lot of intersectionality. Many people can be across many of these groups. When we think of hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis B um, has a much broader uh, uh, distribution globally, um, with more people uh, living with the infection, as I showed you a few slides ago, but you can see relatively the estimates for increased risk of hepatitis B amongst HIV are a little more even. A population um, that seems to have a higher risk here is children, whereas injecting drugs and men who have sex with men is about one to three times higher uh, incidence. So there are some parallels that we'll come back to at the end of this talk, but I wanted to mention here uh, from an infectious disease perspective, some of the aspects of HIV care that we might be able to learn from. One of them is to do with testing services. Uh, they're often uh, both provider-driven and patient or person-focused. They're frequent uh, often and they're targeted often to high risks or particular um, behaviours. Uh, and there's been a move towards self-testing, although, of course, there's financial barriers. Treatment services are out of necessity have had to expand for HIV. There's been primary care and expanded healthcare workforce for HIV um, over many years. And there's been a push toward getting easy or immediate access to antiviral therapy. But much of that was driven by good clinical trial data saying that you had better patient outcomes if people started antiretroviral therapy sooner. But simplified assessment has been a really key part. Long-term engagement is critical in HIV. We need to achieve, uh, people need to achieve virological suppression to get many of the health benefits personally and also the community benefits. It also gives an opportunity to detect and prevent comorbidities as they may arise over time. Prevention and harm reduction are important in HIV as they are in viral, viral hepatitis, but behavioral interventions and biomedical interventions have been expanding. The biomedical, particularly treatment as prevention for HIV is very well established and offers both personal and population benefits. And finally, we have to mention community engagement. It's a really key feature of the HIV response globally, both through guidelines, policy and advocacy, and combating stigma and discrimination. So I'll leave the report card here on how we can learn from viral hepatitis and learn from HIV until the end. Let me present some clinical data next uh, and clinical outcomes really from what we've been seeing in co-infection over the last few years. There's a lot of data out there, much of it you, you may have come across. I just wanted to pick some highlights. I'll start with hepatitis C and HIV co-infection. Uh, an international collaboration called INCHEC, which is short for the International Collaboration on Hepatitis Elimination in HIV Co-infected cohorts, it's a mouthful, so we'll just say in check from now on, 
Uh, this cohort of more than 45,000 people and over 2,000 incident infections has come together across many high-income countries, mainly from key cities that have mostly universal access to testing and treatment. So in theory, most people can get the care they need when they need it. And InCheck's been able to pull data to show the declining uh, uh, incidence of new infection among, for hep C amongst people living with HIV. You can see really clearly on the left-hand side that primary hep C has fallen as direct-acting antiviral for hep Cs have been introduced. On the right, you can see much more obviously that this seemed to happen when we moved from just restricted access to hep C treatment early days when they were very expensive uh, into the very broad access where most restrictions in many countries have been removed so that people can get treated regardless of whether they're injecting, regardless of whether they're living with cirrhosis. However, again, in the same countries, in, in countries in INCHEC, universal treatment does not immediately equate to complete uptake of treatment. And many people uh, talk about access being a big barrier, and of course it is, but it's whilst it's necessary, it's not the only thing we need to get people uh, achieving cure or suppression of their virus. And this INCHEC data is really convincing of that fact. So INCHEC has about half of its cohort being men who, uh, who, have, who have sex with men and about a third who inject drugs. And 30% of the 4,500 participants who've had hepatitis C treatment, all of, remember all have HIV as well, 30% uh, of them remain untreated despite being engaged in HIV care and despite um, being in countries where they have had access to treatment. The median time it takes to start treatment is five months and the range, the interquartile range is between two and 12 months. So there's still a quarter of people who take more than a year to start hepatitis C treatment. There are some factors associated with treatment, such as being on HIV antiviral therapy and having an undetectable HIV viral load, and also having a shorter duration since their first hep C test. But some other characteristics, such as um, behavior, um, sexuality, uh, injecting drugs, these things don't seem to be associated uh, with not having treatment. Once we've successfully treated someone and they've uh, been cured, there is always a chance of reinfection. And reinfection trends are really mirroring primary infection trends that we're seeing. We've seen that since there's been a broader introduction of direct acting antivirals in all the countries in INCHEC, we're starting to see reinfection decline. But importantly, when we think a little harder about what's really going on behind reinfection, the pool of people susceptible to reinfection is increasing all the time because people are being cured. There are more people who, who might end up getting reinfected if they have risk-taking behaviour. But the overall proportion of incident cases due to reinfection is also increasing. So risk reduction interventions for those receiving treatment and post-treatment monitoring are really important. So we do need to think about how we engage people after they've been cured for hep C in ongoing care. In the HIV co-infection setting, people stay in their HIV care, so it's actually easier to offer hepatitis C treatment. But in the mono-infected, the hep C mono-infected space, we often tend to discharge patients from care, maybe encourage them and remind them they should be tested for hepatitis C every year if they've got ongoing risk behaviour. But the system systems we have in place are not as well set up. You can see that in INCHEC, the proportion of reinfection events is increasing over time and the number of previous infections is increasing over time. So I think all of that says that we are going to have to look at ways in our viral hepatitis, mono-infected um, cohorts of how we need to help people stay connected with uh, testing if they have ongoing risk behaviours. And the other thing to think about is do we need to keep um, focusing on cure, uh, confirming cure after treating hep C? Uh, compared with focusing on detecting reinfection because we know that most people who take treatment get a cure. That data has, has been out for a long time. But when you look here at the reinfection rates, we can see that reinfection rates are between 3 and 6% amongst people living with HIV overall, higher amongst people who are, uh, who are men who have sex with men, and similar amongst people who inject drugs. So both being a man who have sex with men and having uh, a recent infection were associated with an increased risk of reinfection about two and a half times in this co-infected systematic review. And, but a longer duration of follow-up after treatment was associated with the decreased incidence. So it might be that some risk abates over time. So let's think briefly about 
simplification of pretreatment assessment because for some time in hepatitis C mono infection, this was uh, causing um, delays unnecessarily and increasing the number of visits. So whilst most people would be well aware that we've moved towards non-invasive assessment for fibrosis, the question that comes up is, do we really need to worry about assessing for fibrosis at all? Now, before some people in the room or online might be uh, pulling their hair out or, or looking at me and cursing, I think the reason I say this is that we've got evidence now from this co-infection cohort from Canada and other studies too, in both co-infection and mono-infection, that there's both biochemical and elastography evidence of regression after cure. Some of it could be inflammation going away, but some of it could and is probably fibrosis regression as too. And the question will be whether long-term this actually reduces someone's risk or even makes their risk um, return somewhere close to normal. We know there will be risks and, for, and I don't want to encourage anyone in the short term to suddenly change and go against their national guidelines about testing for fibrosis before starting hep C treatment. But some of these graphs are really pretty, pretty persuasive that we might see that people are improving uh, their scores and we just need to really translate that into longer term clinical outcomes like cancer and, and death to know what we need to do uh, and maybe make simplification um, even, even easier. Now, I do want to talk about hepatitis B as well. And hep B, HIV um, has its own treatment challenges and opportunities. And I wanted to cite and draw your attention to a systematic review by Platt and others, which looked at the global burden of hep B and HIV to try and work out where we need to focus some of our resources. And some of the key messages that emerged from this review is that testing scale up, scale up for hep B amongst people living with HIV is especially important for high-risk groups because the high-risk groups have a, a high chance of having hep B, as, as I guess that's why they're defined that way. But under-testing means we're missing people with a silent infection. It also stresses the importance of catch-up vaccination of hep B for children, because as I showed you earlier, children seem to have a, a higher proportion of risk, or I should say a relative risk. And another key message that's coming out of uh, this review is that global scale-up of antiviral therapy for people living with HIV using tenofovir-based antiviral regimens provides an opportunity to simultaneously treat hep B, but it also has uh, an off offers the opportunity to treat pregnant women, which might also impact a mother-to-child transmission alongside HIV. And this is, I think, particularly interesting for viral hepatitis, where we've often had um, quite strict rules in many countries for funding reasons and to reduce the amount of time someone's on hepatitis B treatment for mono infection. We've had rules like um, whether they have liver disease, what the ALT uh, elevation is, and what their viral load is before we start hep B antivirals generally. But in HIV, of course, people are usually um, on uh, hep B active drugs to treat their HIV. So they're effectively put on hep B treatment immediately. And a North American cohort of more than 8,000 uh, individuals followed for a couple of decades has been able to, as a couple of other studies have too, but I'm highlighting this one, has been able to show that suppressing HIV and hepatitis B viral load reduces the rate of liver cancer. So whilst the overall incidence of hepatoma in this group was about 2% per year, they this study was able to show that the hazards, the risks of liver cancer were about 2.2 times higher if you had detectable uh, hep B DNA. Interestingly, hepatoma was not associated with higher HIV viral load or the time to achieve virological suppression for HIV or your CD4 count, but it seemed to be mainly related to hepatitis B suppression. So a key takeaway is to consider whether some of the arbitrary rules we have on when to start hep B treatment are still things to persist with going forward. It might be that starting hep B treatment earlier is cancer preventing, and we need to work out ways to make that safe and make it fund fundable. Now, I'm just going to give a couple of examples of a few individual models of care, which might be things we could think about in the broader viral hepatitis space. The first is primary care, uh, primary care versus tertiary care. This is a mono-infected study, a hepatitis C mono-infection study called the PRIME study. And it was one that was done by uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Amanda Wade in Melbourne. And PRIME was um, still the only randomized trial to randomize someone with hepatitis C to get care through their primary care doctor or refer them on to their specialist. We've seen many cohorts as well, but this was done 
just around the time direct acting antivirals were arriving, so we were able to set this study up. And and as we might expect, but it's fantastic to see in a randomised study, that treatment commencement was far higher when someone stayed with their primary care doctor rather than sending them to the specialist to get care, mostly because people didn't follow up in therapy. So this is something which uh, HIV, as I mentioned earlier, has been doing for a long time because community care out of necessity has been really important. Now, further in co-infection, there have been models of care to expand um, treatment services to include nurses and other healthcare providers. And again, just one Australian example to highlight through um, a program we ran to try and get uh, clinical care early days for, for co-infection to everybody in our jurisdiction living with hepatitis C and HIV. And we embedded nurses in every uh, high caseload HIV service where the GPs mainly, the primary care doctors were doing the HIV treatment. And nurses were able to to uh, provide diagnostic support, providing education to clients directly. They could do a lot of the assessment. And remember, it did involve many steps, particularly fibrosis assessment at the time. And then they could help support treatment and then often offer cure and surveillance support going forward. And this was very effective. Everybody liked it. And it was a way of scaling up and getting people very familiar with it. And it's not needed longer term. And this is something to think about. And many countries are, and cities who are providing uh, HIV, Hep C, Hep B, uh, elimination programs they're doing in their own bespoke way. So I just wanted to summarise and finish by uh, looking at the parallels in between HIV and viral hepatitis. I gave you the left-hand side report at the start. Let's think of where we are with Hep B and Hep C. I think that testing services, uh, there are populations at risk who are missing out on testing for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. There's diverse communities, there's language barriers, there's harder to engage populations where other healthcare needs are priorities. But sometimes it's also rules and funding that are limiting um, the scale up of testing, including rapid testing, where we don't yet have self-testing in most jurisdictions. Also treatment services, expanding the workforce for Hep B and Hep C is something many countries are trying to do, but um, HIV seems to have a head start. Access to antivirals could be faster too, because the rules are limiting Hep B treatment, as I spoke about, but we would all know that they, in some countries, they're limiting our access to acute Hep C treatment even though our clinical guidelines and practice is probably to start treatment for hep C whenever we see a patient. Licensing rules say that in theory, hepatitis C treatments for chronic infection after six months. And really that six months is really a historical anachronism. There's no real need why I think, well, why we should have that going forward. We just need to try and break down those regulatory barriers as quick as we can. I've touched on long-term engagement. It's critical for virological suppression for hep B, but, and it's also important for risk, um, risk tailored testing and ongoing follow up for hepatitis C, as I've mentioned. Prevention and harm reduction uh, are areas which I hope at the conference you'll be able to hear others, other speakers, but addiction support and needle syringe access remain big barriers to preventing both hepatitis C and hepatitis B. There's obviously been relatively good success with hep B prevention through birth dose vaccination, and as I've mentioned, tenofovir for hepatoma but there's less biomedical prevention options at the moment for hepatitis C, like a vaccination. So primary research is still needed there to try and address that problem. And finally, I'll say that community engagement is critical to the response. We need to keep the community at the centre of our response, both in the political and policy sphere and in the clinician and the research sphere. Um, drug stigma especially persists, and that's a real problem for hepatitis C. And law reform is difficult because that often gets in the way. But I think HIV over... A few decades has shown that these barriers can be broken down even though there's many still to come. So I'd like to conclude there and acknowledge my collaborators at uh, Alfred Health, Monash University and Burnett Institute in particular. And thank you very much for listening to the presentation.